Okay, let's let's talk about blood pressure because I I think this is one of those areas that I've personally become more and more interested in over the past year, um, and it's actually become more of a concern to me maybe over the past two years through the lens of the kidney. So we have this organ that just doesn't get much attention. I, I'm trying to think outside of my podcast with Chris Sonnenday where we talked about kidney and liver transplantation. I don't think I've got a single podcast that deals with the kidney. Um, and it's a really special organ. And I sort of explained to my patients that in our bootstrapping approach to living an extra few years on this planet, a lot of it requires a phase shift in time, right? So if you're 50 years old, you really need to be held to the standard of a healthy 40 year old if you want to live an extra 10 years. That's the way you want to think about it. You want to think about that in terms of your mind. You want to think about that in terms of your body. You want to think about that in terms of your coronary arteries. You want to think about it in terms of your bone density, but you got to think about it in terms of your kidneys. And so when we look at a person and estimate their glomerular filtration rate, which we use, you know, cystatin C to measure that, we've largely abandoned uh, uh, creatinine. Um, it's really tempting to say, well, you know, this guy's 55 years old. His EGFR is 70 mils per minute. That's good enough. But in reality, it's not actually, uh, it's far from good enough. And the kidney is not uniquely, but exquisitely sensitive to high blood pressure. Um, I, again, I'm, I'm not a nephrologist and I never really... I don't think I remember much from nephrology, but I certainly remember that something about its vasculature is incredibly sensitive, right? It probably has to do with the fact that it's such a tiny organ that takes such a high amount of our cardiac output. Um, and I suspect just like the heart and the brain, it's very sensitive to pressure. Um, and so that really is the lens through which I think about this first and foremost with, with the, the meaning even the slightest amount of elevation in in uh, blood pressure is going to interfere with long-term kidney health and also with heart and brain health. So, so really there's a win across the board if we just normalize blood pressure. So uh, I'll pause at that and, and, and have you just kind of explain from the um, ASCVD perspective, the importance of blood pressure and how it stacks up with smoking ApoB and some of the other heavy hitting risk factors. Yeah, so I, I guess I, I just want to acknowledge how strongly I agree with you about the neglect, how much we neglect the kidney as an organ and nephrology as a subspecialty of medicine. Uh, I actually used to give uh, a lecture on hypertension to the first year medical students at UCSF, and I did that in conjunction with a kidney pathologist who interestingly was, uh, had been at Hopkins when I was a medical student, was my advisor, very interesting woman who's now retired, named Jean, Jean Olson, and she she and I co-gave the lecture. She gave the pathology part and I gave the clinical part. And I learned so much about the importance of the kidney and regulating blood pressure in that, you know, in giving that lecture with her for however many years it was, 10 years. Um, so it's, it's, uh, it's both a, an important cause of blood pressure. And in fact, I think if you go back and look at, um, you know, Rick Lifton, who's sort of one of the premier human geneticists in, in, you know, history, member of the National Academy, some probably should win a Nobel Prize. He characterized all of the single gene mutations that lead to extreme increases or decreases in blood pressure. Uh, you know, I think at the time, and this is 20 years ago, there were, there were like, you know, 10 each, 10, 10 mm. single gene mutations that led to people who had sort of really, really low blood pressure, had to constantly supplement salt and do things like that. And then 10 that led to extremely high blood pressure. And I think like nine or whatever it is, 19 out of 20 of these things were located in the same location in the, uh, in the proximal collecting doctor in the tubule. It was, it was like you couldn't have picked a place wow. that was more important evolutionarily for how we handle volume and, uh, and salt and solute. So uh, it's an incredibly important organ, both as a cause of high blood pressure and also as a consequence. And, and those experiments, you know, Gene showed these beautiful slides that I'll send along sometime, you know, pictures of what happens to, to your kidney after it's exposed to low, increased levels of blood pressure over time. So um, 
it, it was interesting because I was giving this lecture as a cardiologist during the kidney block. It always felt, I felt out of place. So most people kind of know that when they go to their doctor and they get their blood pressure checked, normal is about 120 over 80 millimeters of mercury. Um, what do we know about how much that changes in a healthy person across the course of the day? Uh, so when they're sleeping, when they're ambulatory and walking around, but not under stress, i.e. not exercising, when they are exercising vigorously, when they're, you know, under stress, physiologic stress, psychological stress, uh, all of these different things that we do every single day, surely our blood pressure must change. And yet most of us, myself included, have virtually no idea of how our blood pressure is changing under those situations, even if under perfect optimal conditions, i.e. sitting down, legs uncrossed for five minutes, it reads 120 over 80. So what do we know about the rest of the time? So I guess it's, it, we don't, I don't want to get too distracted, but I, I think it's fascinating. I've thought about this a lot. And the question of what's normal is, you know, we all assume 120 over 80 is normal. If you look at blood pressures across different animal species, it's mostly in that range. There are some that are outliers. Obviously, a giraffe is, is the best example of an outlier species with mm -hmm. much higher blood pressure that it needs to have to be able to pump blood up to that very hit that head that's sitting way up high. Um, it is weird to me from an evolutionarily evolutionary perspective why we would have the same blood pressure as a mouse right it's a little tiny creature who walks around on four legs why should we have the same blood pressure it speaks i think to the conservation of this sort of vascular system that we have i think most people when i was a medical student i'm sure you were the same were taught that 120 over 80 is normal but that's just normal whether you're uh you know 7 17 or 75 I don't think we have a good understanding of, well, we have an understanding of what is epidemiologically normal as we age. And so we know that blood pressure does go up with each decade of life. Um, if I had access to, my, to that lecture I used to give, I could show you what happens. But, but certainly with each decade of life, your blood pressure goes up on average if you're looking at a population of people. Is that normal? Is that part of normal healthy aging, or is that just a function of pathology? Is it a function of something going wrong over time? To your point, is it something about decreased kidney function or maybe is it increased vascular stiffness over, over, over time? I think all of those things are possible and prob probably probable. So for a long time, it was assumed that a blood pressure that was normal for somebody in their 20s and 30s was probably too low and not normal for somebody who was in their 60s, 70s, and 80s. And so we let had sort of had this permissive hypertension in elderly people because we thought, well, gosh, they required it. It's just part of the aging process. And it really hasn't been until the past really 10 plus years that we've begun to ask specifically in really well-designed clinical trials is that the case? And is it the case when it comes to looking at, at important clinical outcomes? And I think, uh, you know, my take on this now is different than it was 15 years ago. And that is that 120 over 80 is normal no matter where you are in life and that anything above that is abnormal. And, you know, just to kind of get to the punchline, what I tell patients is that my aspiration is that we can get you as close to 120 over 80 as we can without harming you. Because there are certainly ha potential harms that are associated with treating people to these low numbers. They can be in the form of side effects or impacts on lifestyle. They can be in the form of real toxicity, um, you know, hyperkalemia, risk of death. I mean, there's all kinds of potential issues. That it's not just a simple intervention like treating LDL or ApoB lower and lower and lower. There's really no consequence at all. There is a consequence of lowering blood pressure too low in this case. So that's my overall kind of philosophy of how to think about blood pressure is I do think there's now evidence from good clinical trials that 120 over 80 is normal and that we should try to get there as best we can without making a mess. So through that lens, basically we're saying that the 
amount of float that we see in blood pressure. Again, we're all we're talking about blood pressure in a very narrow instance, which is seated, resting, et cetera. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. We'll come back to the other point, but yeah. uh, just to build off that, that when that drifts up to one twenty five, one thirty, one thirty five, one forty in an aging population, we're actually calling that pathologic in the same way that I think we would all agree that the reduction in glomerular filtration rate, the reject reduction in ejection fraction, the reduction in pulmonary function, okay, yes, that occurs with aging, but that doesn't mean that it's not part of an aging process and therefore part of something we want to minimize, correct? That's right, we lose muscle mass as we age. Is that something we want to accept and that's normal or do we want to try to do what we can to preserve the muscle mass that we had? It younger in life. And again, I think here the the crutch that we fall back on and is good, high quality, well done clinical trials. And in this case, we have now have them. And it's not just sort of an opinion based thing that says, oh, we'll really get closer to 120 over 80. We actually have evidence that being closer to 120 over 80 impacts mortality. And, uh, and that permitting people to run higher to a level that we used to consider to be just basically pre-hypertension or just normal, even an older person, 140 over 90, that, that leads to an, a significant increase in risk of dying. So to me, I think uh, we've learned a lot and I don't, I don't consider it to be a normal function of aging. I think there may be a process, there's pro obviously a process that goes along with aging that there's a decrease in function of a lot of different things that lead, combines to lead to this increase in blood pressure, but I don't leave it alone. Thank you.